talking about language and identity? Yes, I told him that was the track we're working on right now. So I'm moving okay. into racism in the media next week. Uh -huh. <laughs> Your favorite topic. Yeah. Well, we'll just have a roundtable discussion about different aspects of all of this, sure. I think. Um, we have several native languages here, mostly English, right? But Ukrainian, Russian, Marathi, anything else? Okay, whatever your native language is, how many of you can speak more than one variety of it? Do you speak English the same way to everybody? Or do you speak it differently with friends? From, say, a job interview? Are you conscious of making a difference? I teach in Texas, and Texans have a very distinctive way of speaking English. Y'all Midwesterners all sound <laughs> sort of <coughs> Midwestern. <coughs> but Southern speech in this country has been stigmatized as you know, the result of historical factors. I mean, the South lost the Civil War and everything. And so people have, the media actually, has pushed this idea of Southern speech as being sort of hickish and country and redneckish and so on. And Texans, my students are acutely aware of when they sound Texan. And so I remember on one occasion, uh, a student at the beginning of an English class came to me and she said, you know, and she had a strong Texas uh, accent. And she said, you know, my parents have been sending me to elocution classes for years to try and get me not to sound so Texan. And I still sound Texan, and I hope it won't count against me in an English class. <laughs> and that was one thing. Then uh, a colleague of mine in the English department, who uh, is retired now, but from Arkansas also, English professor, sounded really southern, and he showed me one of the student evaluations that he got, anonymous evaluation, <clears throat> and it said, he's a really good professor, but he shouldn't be teaching uh, in an English class with speech like that. And one of the things that I show, I don't use a textbook, but I, I make a workbook that the students get and I, you know, compile it from different things. And a couple of things in that workbook are advertisements for classes to help you get rid of whether you speak Southern or whether you speak New York or Black. Uh, and of course, you have to pay money. But it, the wording is is so slanted because it tells them they will help you to speak properly. Get the, I was really concerned about her tripping over the cord. <laughs> Do you want to welcome me? Um, maybe we'll just, just tell Dr. Hancock who you are. And since you just came in, he seems to be pausing for you. So. <laughs> uh, my name is Bree Campbell, um, and I teach English at uh, my school English. And she's in her third program. program. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> third trimester, right? We know what you're doing. Yeah. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> Do you want to introduce yourself, honey, honey? Yeah. Because uh, the, the class doesn't know you either, because she took this class last year. Well, so she wanted to join so. since she heard about him last year. Yeah, my name is Honey Honey, and uh, I'm from West Africa, Burkina Faso, and I'm a master's student. I'm just completing my second year, so hopefully I'll graduate this May. Uh -huh. And what is your language? French. What is your African language? Um, I speak Jula, Bomo, and Mori. Um, the side of Mali, they call it Bambara because it's like. Um, but it's the same. Yeah, you know the level ah, okay. of languages. Jula really? and Bambara. Yeah, close. very close. Yeah. Well, we're talking about language and identity and attitudes and so on. And the, uh, the way we speak is really so much a part of our whole identity because people know who you are without even seeing you. They hear you on the phone and they know who you are. And there's all kinds of ways you can go with this because people judge language, educators judge language and rank language. And in one of my classes I, I talk about, I won't even call it uh, standard English, which already has some implication, but I call it book English. And <clears throat> uh, in fact, the class I'm teaching now, <coughs> I deal with the history of the language, where English comes from, how it's developed, and how there are so many different dialects, and how book English really is the only artificial dialect of the language. It only started to emerge around 1500 with the introduction of printing and there was something called the Great Vowel Shift that changed things a bit. And um, it was an artificial dialect created by the educated elite. Um, but it's become what people think is quotes, proper English. And I, uh, see th this would work a lot better if y'all were Texan. <laughs> <laughs> because the, the, the differences are greater. Um, but in Southern speech, in Texan speech, there are constructions that you probably don't use here. Uh, and everybody talks this way, but people will deny that they speak this way. And one of the um, constructions that I use to test the students, um, I'll ask them something like, how many of you say ain't? Well, everybody says ain't, but they pretend they don't because it's an English class and I'm an English professor. <laughs> And they think if they admit to saying ain't, I'm going to think badly. This is how they're indoctrinated by these ideas. And I get them to admit that. And I, and I say, how many of you say I might could do it? And you probably nobody says it in this part of the country, but it's really common in the South. Um, and no hands will go up. Maybe one hand will go up. And my next question is, how many of you have heard people say, I might could do it? Then all the hands go up, you know, as long as it's not me. As long as it's someone else, I can admit to it. And then I say, how many of you have heard, I could might do it? No hands go up. How many of you have heard somebody say, I could might do it? Still no hands go up, because nobody says, I could, might do it. But millions of people say, I might could do it. So I say, no, well, here's an anomaly. Because you admit that you've heard people saying, I might could do it. 
Is that right or wrong? It's wrong. But you've heard it, yes. But you also all admit that you've never heard I could, might do it. True? Yes, true. Why? Well, it's just wrong. So, you're telling me that there's a right and a wrong way to speak incorrectly. <laughs> Surely this is a, a conflict of some sort. You, you have to speak incorrectly, correctly. <laughs> right? <clears throat> so I, I then lead into something that really confuses them, which is the opposition on the one hand between good and bad language, and on the other hand appropriate and inappropriate language. And I still have students who can't quite figure out the difference. <coughs> because when we talk about language, we can either talk about it as linguists, or we can talk about it, say, as sociologists. In other words, the purpose of language is to communicate. If you're not communicating properly, you're not speaking the language effectively. So that if I were to say, I ain't got no money, you've all understood that 100%. You, ex you know exactly what I mean. You might say, well, that's not grammatical. It actually is grammatical, depends whose rules you're going by. But in terms of communicative effect, it's 100% okay. What people don't like about it then is not linguistic, it's social. Well, I think that's wrong. Why? Because the people who talk like that, I place in a group. I also, in, in the same workbook, have a photocopy from the Greater Oxford English Dictionary for the entry for ain't. And ain't, until maybe 150 years ago, was perfectly standard English, just like don't and can't. And so was ain't. Um, and it's only for some kind of social reasons that the word has fallen out of what is accepted as standard English. And that's why I don't like standard English, because it's not one thing. In uh, this country, you can say, you have to say, I had gotten, he had gotten over it. In Britain, a teacher, an English teacher in high school, will mark you wrong if you say gotten. You have to say, I had got. And that's probably true in India, mm -hmm. um, in the British sphere of influence. Um, but here it's correct, there it's incorrect. It's the same language. It's a matter really uh, in a kind of abstract way of who decides what. When we talk, we f change the way we talk to suit who we're with in the social context of the discourse. And obviously, you're going to want to speak more like book English in a formal situation because we associate your understanding of the rules with education. In Britain, the phrase is received pronunciation, RP. You heard that phrase. Received because you receive it in the classroom. You didn't bring it from home. You learned it out of a book. The teacher gave it to you and you received it. And the more you can speak book English, the more it reflects how far you've gone with your education. But it's not a natural English. I try to convince my students that 
it's not better linguistically than any other kind of English, but it's an extremely useful tool because foreigners learn book English. At least it's one kind of English or a collection of very similar kinds of English that if a non-native speaker is going to learn English, and it will usually be in a formal situation at English classes in Tokyo or Buenos Aires or someplace, but it's going to be that sort of English. Because if you were to give a talk in, I don't know, New Delhi, and you had a strong Scottish way of speaking, a lot of your audience wouldn't follow what you were saying because that's not the kind of English they've been exposed to. So it's a good thing to know that sort of English, but not to replace the way you speak, but to learn more than one way to speak. And actually, most of us can do this anyway at this level. But there are lots and lots of places in the English-speaking world where, and I'm talking about children especially, only speak one way. And it's not book English. In the rural south, in ethnic uh, parts of the country, African-American varieties of English, Chicano English, and so on, and there are other kinds of Englishes beginning in the United States. There's a, certainly there's a Cajun English that's been around for a long time in Louisiana, um, but there's a Korean English now. There's a very distinctive Hawaiian English. They call pidgin. It's really not a pidgin anymore, um, but a Creole. Uh, but when children who only speak their home dialect find themselves in a classroom and the teacher is expecting them to handle book English and they can't do it, they may be criticized by the teacher or corrected by the teacher, but can't do what the teacher wants because they don't know how and that kid is just going to clam up because he or she is going to be scared that he might say the wrong thing and the teacher will pick on him again. So the way to handle that is not to say anything. And that's only going to hurt the kid, not the teacher, obviously. Um, I remember, I'll give you an anecdote from Sierra Leone. When I lived in Sierra Leone, where they speak Creole. Um, English is the official language, but only expatriates, and the very few, there's more now, but back then there were very few. Nobody speaks English natively. They speak Creole, but they have to learn English because it's the language of the colony. It's not a colony now, but it used to be. And they were severely punished for speaking Creole in school, even in the playground. And they were nasty punishments. I mean, kneeling on a pencil or balancing yourself on your fingertip and one foot, and, you know, weird punishments. Um, and I was in a classroom and the teacher, who was a Sierra Leonean herself, but the classes are in English and the kids are struggling. And she was having each, we were in their mid-teens, I guess, to stand up and say something, you know, what did I do during the summer holidays or, you know, the sort of things in English. And they were really struggling and very formal and standing and trying to speak in English. And I said, let them speak Creole. She said, oh, I can't do that. We're not allowed to do that. I said, come, just, just for me. I won't tell. I said, just let them do it all over again in Creole. And so she, she said, OK, let's see what happens. And immediately, their whole bodies changed. They became more relaxed and uh, creative and, and 
the difference was, was so clearly apparent. It didn't make any changes in the school system. They're beginning now, only now, to realize the wisdom of teaching in the native language. Teaching English, certainly, but through the medium of the native language, not jumping right in. Um, back in the 1970s, there was a very interesting court case. It's, it's called the Lao case that happened in Wisconsin. The Constitution gives you the right to an education in the language you know best. And a Chinese-American dad from California took the California State Board of Education to court and said, I want my child to get his education in Mandarin Chinese because that's what we speak at home, that's what he understands best. And he won the case. It was called the Lao, K-L-A-U case. But we refer to the Ann Arbor case because a group of African American parents said, we want our kids educated in African American English. And they used the Lao case as a precedent. And they won this case. But this immediately raised some more issues. How do you teach in a dialect, unless, first of all, unless you can speak it yourself? But what guidelines are there? And there are a whole bunch of um, teacher's manuals in a kind of standardized African-American English were produced, and, and primers or trimmers, as you say it, um, were produced as well. It, it, but then there was immediately a backlash, a criticism of the whole thing. And who do you think the most vocal opponents were to the idea of teaching using African American English in this kind of a situation? Who do you think didn't like that? Who? Yes. Yes. The middle class parents objected more strongly than anybody else. Their argument was, well, this is just another technique to make us even more different, to separate us out from the mainstream. Um, and of course, there were other more activistic African-American parents who thought this was a great idea. And uh, the whole thing has never been completely resolved. And it flares up from time to time. And we hear about Ebonics and, and so on. But the fact of the matter <coughs> is, the testing in the special schools where the, where the experimental teaching in African-American English uh, so the kids were understanding more easily. Uh, their comprehension and so on, their academic achievement levels did noticeably go up, simply because they were understanding the teacher better. Um, so these, these are things that affect uh, school curricula and especially attitudes. People will deny speaking a language if they think it has no prestige. And that brings us back um, to earlier today, because uh, I'm, I've been, I'm here really to talk about Romani. And in parts of Europe where Roma are so oppressed that in, in some places they will deny being Roma. In, for example, in uh, Macedonia and Albania, They've created new identities like Ashkali and Egyptian um, because to, to be identified as Roma is already um, such a stigma that they've denied their own ethnicity. And it's very common to deny speaking Romani. 
and uh, there is um, a Creole spoken in this country called Gullah, which you probably heard of. And there's a variety of Gullah, a very old-fashioned, conservative kind of Gullah, still just about spoken in South Texas. And there's an interesting history of why it's spoken there. But they will deny that they know what you're talking about. They will speak in. And this is often the case in Creole-speaking societies in a lot of places because Creoles are associated with slavery and oppression and so on. And um, especially middle-class people who are upwardly mobile, they want to distance themselves from that and will just deny uh, that they even speak these languages. They, they all do. That's the, the, the strange thing about it. It's not even strange. You can understand it. But they will deny that they can speak it. And yet, when you get into the Creole culture and Creole language itself, so many Creoles have little, not proverbs, but sayings. Uh, for instance, in, in Haitian Creole, um, they say Creole is for telling the truth, but French is for telling lies. Um, attitudes like that. Um, so how do we get past that? How do, how do we get past the um, attitudes? My, my students will sound really Texan deliberately in order to show solidarity of their Texan identity if, for example, the Texas Longhorns win the season and, um, you know, reason to celebrate. So everybody wants to be seriously Texan and, and then everybody gets super Texan, exaggeratedly Texan. You get uh, another phenomenon. I'm just throwing out random, really random, bits and pieces that I'm hope, hoping you can elaborate upon from your own experiences. Um, because some dialects are, have lower prestige than others, and often uh, are spoken by people who have less power than others, um, these ways of speaking show some sort of defiance. And so you will get exaggerated use, especially from young people, when, you know, everybody, everybody here, I'm sure, you go through a, a <coughs> stage when you're rebellious and you want to be, you know, an activist and you want to stand up against the, the man and all of that. And you can do that by exaggerating your speech. And in London, the, the, the dialect that has no prestige is Cockney. And teachers work so hard to get Cockney kids to stop sounding Cockney. But you will get a stage, usually mid-teens, maybe a little older, when rebellious kids will speak exaggerated cockney, even kids who never spoke it at all. And it will often come out wrong. And it's referred to as mockney. <laughs> <laughs> and you get in this country um, people who want to be associated with the street, even white kids trying to sound ghetto. And it's so artificial, but they're trying to make a statement that this is how I identify myself. What they're doing is really looking sort of silly. Because the way you speak is so much a part of your identity and your group identity. And if you're not really a part of that group, people can tell immediately if, if they are really from that group and they hear you trying to sound as though you were part of the group and you just give yourself away immediately. Anyway, these are just little snippets of stuff.
Maybe we can open it up to their questions. I know they all brought questions related to your article or anything about Roma. We have a money person here to talk to us tonight, so let's take advantage of anything you want to know. Um, I guess we can just open it up. Can anybody? Thank you. Um, <laughs> shy you just first talked one. about Janelle Mockney. Um, this is actually, it may be a little bit off topic, but it was more from the uh, mock Spanish article. Um, and I was just wondering if there can be some, you know, are there positive ways as well? Like I'm thinking like, oh, I have mucho dinero, cool, you know. Are there, or is that still pretty prejudiced? <laughs> um. I, I think it's a matter of self-confidence. Um, for example, you can make fun of certain ethnic groups, but you mustn't make fun of certain other ethnic groups. And usually the ones that you can make fun of, and, and who will make fun of themselves, are more powerful groups. You know, you can make fun of <coughs> French people and German people, and nobody's going to look at you and call you racist and so on. Because these are big, powerful countries, and who gives a damn? But if it's, if it's a group that doesn't have the sort of power thing um, and feels in some way victimized, then you're adding to that. I personally think it's a great shame that political correctness has made everybody walk on eggshells. Because I, I think there's a lot of ethnic humor is really funny, as long as it's not hurtful. And that's where you have to be careful. But now you mustn't, do you remember, maybe you're all too young, but maybe Polak jokes, yeah. Polish jokes, how many Poles does it take to unscrew a light bulb? And Polish Americans got all upset with that. And, the way they put a stop to it was to organize and protest, um, and this is a really American way of doing this sort of thing, um, boycott the advertisers who were funding the TV shows with these comedians that would tell Polak jokes. Um, and of course, as soon as it hits your pocketbook, then the pressure is going to be applied. Uh, but yeah, things like Mockney or um, fake Spanish and so on, uh, I don't see the harm in that because they're not real. If anything, they're going to make people laugh at you, not anybody else, right? <laughs> The article, the article lays out by, she's talking about the article from, by Jane Hill, which you're, aren't you supposed to read that for next week? Is I'm sorry, am I ahead? Yeah. Oh, I think you're I'm ahead sorry. of me, yeah, so I'm not sure if all yeah, of Yeah, because I was thinking, isn't it racist? Yeah, yeah but so, sorry. this is good because we've heard kind of both sides and I think now you can read the article and we'll, we'll have a good discussion next week on that. Um, um, so, I've kind of been thinking about this as we were talking in class the last couple of weeks and listening to you talk about African American English and Cockney. Do you think there is such a thing as poor grammar? Or yes, is it all absolutely. The grammar, grammar is a set of rules. Mm -hmm. When people think of grammar, I mean that word alone has various interpretations. For some people it can mean the book itself. You go into the bookstore, do you have a French grammar? meaning a book, which is rules. But they are the rules of book French or book English. If history had been different, if, if the South had won instead of the North, Southern speech would be the prestige variety of American English. If African Americans had colonized and, and made Europeans of slaves, let's say, then African-American English would be the norm. It's only social history that's created this. What we do, though, because it's not codified, 
is not know the difference between what is legitimately dialect X and what is a mistake. American English, all English, is full of mistakes. People who speak it every day. Um, well, let me, let me finish the first train of thought here. There is a right and a wrong way to speak black English. You can speak black English incorrectly because it has its own structure. All languages have structure. Um, but I, I give my, I should have brought my workbook. This would have been really good. Uh, I give my students a list of about 20 sentences, some of which are quotes correct according to book English rules, and some of them are not correct. And they have to tell me which is which. And they get them all wrong. Um, do you know the difference between not as big and not so big? No, I'm sure you don't. <laughs> Do you know that you didn't graduate from high school? You were graduated from high school, did you know that? Um, do you know that you can't say, well you can say it in the right context, but everybody says more importantly when they mean more important. It's not an adverbial construction, you know. Um, people say different than all Americans say different than when it's not a comparative construction. Things don't differ than things, they differ from things. You can say uh, this one is more different than because now it's, it's comparative. But you can't just say different than, you have to say different from. Are these mistakes? If everybody is saying it, when does it stop being a mistake? It's the majority. Um, What's the difference between I will and I shall? There's a grammatical difference. I don't think people know what it is anymore. People get who and who mixed up now. Language is changing all the time. And people, the kind of people who write letters to the Sunday newspaper complaining about the speech of young people, there's always going to be somebody who's going to complain. And there has to be a, a norm of some sort. But, and it's, it's good, I, I'm all in favor of book English. It's nice to have something that changes less frequently than how we speak with our friends. But I would hate to take that kind of way of speaking away from anybody, because that's, that's who you are. But you asked about black English, African American English, African-American vernacular English. Um, it has, like any other kind of English, it has a lot of slang. But black English itself is not slang. It's, a, it's an ethnolect, which, like any other kind of English, has slang, which changes constantly, like slang does. Um, and there are words which are not slang words. My wife is African American. She she can speak it. I mean, she that's all she speaks with her family. When she's uh, at work, she doesn't speak like that. She's she's good at going back and forth. But uh, there are. Um, let me let me try some words on you and see if you understand these African American words. Do you know what flooding is? It's a reference to dress, the clothes, you know what it is? When your pants are too short? Yes, when oh. your pants are too short, yes. <laughs> yes, I, I wonder if I that's that an age thing, thing too, because <laughs> I knew that when I was growing up. <laughs> People what is, told me that once. Um, what is the kitchen? What part of your body is the kitchen? Yes, you know that one, that's the nape of your neck. Uh, what is a bite? Bite? No. It's a wedgie. No, when your pants go up, you're behind. But that's a bite. Um, there's lots of things. That, those are just lexical things. There are structures as well. 
um, put the baby on a blanket. Doesn't mean put the baby on a blanket, it means take a blanket and put it on the baby. Like put the baby on a hat. There's a, the direct and indirect objects and so on. Um, she working and she be working. There's a, a difference there. Um, I've been there and I've been there. She's been married, she's been married. This is creeping into general colloquial American English. Um, uh, you be done broke it. Right? You will have broken it by some point of time in the future. These are all legitimate fixed grammatical forms. If there were a grammar, there are grammars, but they're kind of academic. Um, of African American English, uh, these would be the grammatical rules. And if you were to be tested in it, you could be marked wrong if you weren't getting the rules right. But we don't think in those terms. For one thing, African Americans themselves haven't had prestige historically. In, in Texas, where Spanish is so widely spoken, even the native speakers think their Spanish isn't very good. They think it's all mixed up with English. And certainly there are English words in American Spanish. But nowhere near as many as there are French words in English. Nowhere near as many. In fact, if you take the dictionary of English, like the Oxford or Webster, and do a percentage count of how many words are actually English, i.e. could be traced back to Old English, it's 28%. Most of the English lexicon is adopted from other languages. Nobody says anything about English being mixed. You know, nobody calls it uh, Fringlish. But, uh, you know, they can say, oh, American Spanish is all mixed with English. It has to do with prestige. It also has to do with time depth, of course. English was mixed a long time ago, so people have sort of forgotten. I um, have a question about um, something that you mentioned in your article, mm -hmm. um, um, and that is the similarity of uh, treatment of Romani and African American population in certain aspects. So my question is, um, like, how do you explain that similarity, um, uh, the stereotype, you know, and, and and question that probably sits on top of it? How do you explain the kind of paradoxical love hate uh, oh. uh, relationship. So on one hand, you know, considered hyper cool. On the other hand, you know, it's once somebody associates themselves with it too much, maybe then it becomes kind of. Oh, you know. I think I think uh, I, I know what you're saying there. It's this. It's this. Uh, I hate you. I love your music. It's that kind of thing. It's this two-sided attitude. A lot of racists and anti-black racists in this country nevertheless love black music. And it's, it's sort of weird. Um, absolute racists against Roma in Europe nevertheless go to cafes where there's a Romani ensemble playing. They think this is the best, you know. But at the same time, detesting the people playing the music. And uh, there's a much better essay that I did, better than that one, um, which has to do with, um, it's called The Sexualization of Women of Color. And I talked about this Can I yesterday. Can I get a hold of that? Do you I'll send it to you. Can you send it to me? Um, Postcard to you. And it, 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 it's how non-European women, colonized women really, have been portrayed by white men in Western literature. And it's not 
and it's a complicated thing because it has to do first of all with just men lusting after women but that, that's superficial what it's really doing is um, and, and you watch movies like this where uh, Hollywood movies where the white guy will go into a non-white environment people uh, Native American comes to mind and become one of the group and then solve their problems for them and, and then the one of the women falls in love with him which is sort of an insult to the Native American men besides anything else but it's it's very much a theme there I mean I've got a list of this somewhere um, but it, it, it's about dominance and how you can uh, dominate a colonized people um, which obviously resents the fact that they're being dominated and they're keeping you a, a, as much of a distance as they're able but still because you are in control you can take what you want including the unattainable women and, and so it's a thing but at the same time because you are colonizing you are the colonizer. You feel superior. You justify your superiority by diminishing the colonized people. And you, you take away their civilization. We, the early books about the first contacts with the non-Western world, um, talking about savages, references to Native Americans as savages constantly Africans as savages uncivilized and so on um, it was a way of elevating the colonizer and say well it makes sense that we're colonizing because these people need to be shown the right way they have to be made Christian for example um, and so it's a it's a power thing but at the same time, we, we are attracted to what, what's forbidden. You know, it's like your first cigarette when you're a kid. Um, so there's an attractiveness and at the same time a repulsion. And I think that's maybe what you're referring mm -hmm. to. Mm -hmm. This, this uh, I, I have a, a nasty phrase, a Latin phrase in there, inter, what is it, inter urinam et faikis sedet amor. It's a nasty phrase, but it makes the point. <laughs> um, and if you read the article, you figure it out. Uh, it's this two-sided love-hate thing. One of the um, novels, yesterday I was showing these different Harley Quinn romances with gypsy characters, mm -hmm. and the back of one of them is the high-born lady so-and-so falls for this gypsy, wandering, handsome gypsy boy, and uh, she's repulsed by him, but strangely attracted to him. And this two-sided uh, feeling is, I don't know, it's a theme. It's a well-developed theme in literature and sociology as well. But it's probably what, mm -hmm. what you're getting at there. question is related to the use of language. I think it is first to communicate and understand each other. So how do we do with these differences between, between uh, way, your way of speaking? If, for example, <coughs> African Americans stick to their way of speaking, mm -hmm. how would the others maybe understand them? And if the others stick to the way of speaking, like the different accents in America here, depending on the states, how could we well communicate if we don't get all the meaning of the different words and grammatical structures that we use? In? I'm thinking maybe we need something standard that would allow each one to understand each other. Well, that, that's, that's the reason for 
a standard dialect, a book dialect. Um, most, I, I guess I could say most African Americans who speak African American English can approximate their speech to something more uh, mainstream. And that's what they would speak to an outsider, if you like, somebody outside the group. Um, and in fact, if you were not a member of the group and you tried to speak black English, uh, they might be offended by that, unless you could do it properly. Um, it would sound a bit condescending. Um, there are many parts of the country where people can only speak the way they speak, but you probably wouldn't be in a position where you would be talking to them in the first place. Uh, um, in Texas, and I'm sure here increasingly, uh, is a very big Chicano population. And Chicanos are not Mexicans, but neither are they Anglos. They're Hispanic, but a good many of them don't speak Spanish. So, Mexican-Americans who speak Spanish are Mexican-Americans and they have Spanish. Go home, they can speak Spanish. Chicanos, English monolingual Chicanos, don't have another ethnic language to be in. And yet, they have, just like black English, there is an ethnolect, which is often called Chicano English. I mean, I have a few books that I have on it. I call it Chicano English, which is an ethnolectal variety that you can hear on, on, on the campus at my university. If there are a group of Chicano students talking to each other, they're speaking English, but it is a very distinctive ethnolectal variety, the intonation especially, uh, maybe a few constructions, and words, it's still English. If a non-Hispanic friend wanders up and joins the group, they'll switch out of it, just move it closer to book English. Black students do the same thing all the time, and they have to do it. Um, I had a two different stories here. We had a graduate student come to Texas from St. Louis some years ago. She came from a very fancy upper class African American family. Her dad was a, uh, a minister in a big church and so on and she came to study opera and she could not speak black English at all. She spoke extremely middle of the road English. And she, she told me that the, the black students on campus were kind of a bit standoffish. And she said, I'm going to have to learn to speak the way they speak because they're sort of ignoring me. And she, she realized the necessity. The other little story is that there was another student at UT who was born in Iran. This is years ago. Um, she was the daughter of uh, a staff member, African-American family attached to the American Embassy in Tehran. And she, she could speak Persian. She went to the American University and she spoke English, but her dad had the wisdom also to teach her black English. So that when she finally came back to live in the United States, she was set up for that. And uh, those are kind of two contrasting little anecdotes. Yeah. Somebody else who hasn't had a chance yet? We've got time for just about two more questions. I'll ask the question. <laughs> 
many, many thoughts about what we've talked about today. It's been really interesting. Um, but I'm also, I guess I'm thinking a little bit about the difference, bet- if you see that there is a difference between cultural appropriation and cultural appreciation. Because I'm thinking about, for instance, you mentioned white students who sort of adopt this hip hop culture. Or in the case of your article, people who you know, feel this longing for this, this gypsy culture that isn't, isn't actual. Mm. And so I guess I'm wondering, like, what is the harm in those things? And I think I'm inclined to think that there is actually <coughs> some harm, or is it, is it innocuous? Like, <coughs> can we appreciate cultures without appropriating them, et cetera? Any, any thoughts you have about that? I think, uh, and I, I think I make this point in that article, it's a reflection on certain aspects of American society which sort of blandifies differences and people have a longing to have more of an identity than they think they have and so will resurrect a historical identity maybe your grandparents were immigrants from Germany so you get all interested in that even though you don't have a direct association. Um, but that is mo- that says more about society at large. Uh, and and we're, there's this tendency, overall tendency, to do this. I mean, there was a time in the 1920s when if you had a long, unpronounceable name, or a name with a vowel on the end, they would change it for you uh, at uh, Ellis Island. You know, don't come here calling yourself Kofnovsky. You know, you're Smith from now on. Um, But appropriating other cultures is a little bit sad if you think. It's one thing to become fascinated and learn all you can about Apaches or Navajo. But to reach a point where you start to say, I think I have Navajo blood, then it gets a little sad because you're looking for something. And the, the bottom line is, if you think you're Navajo, will Navajos think you're Navajo? And they, they won't. And then you'll just feel embarrassed and sad. But you can certainly become completely immersed. I mean, I went through a phase of ancient Egypt, you know. I just read everything I could about the pharaohs and everything. I could never be an ancient Egyptian (laughs) for several reasons. But um, that didn't stop me immersing myself and then moving on to something else. Do you think there's any issue in terms of power? Because it seems to be largely white folks, well in the case of like hip-hop and in in this case as well in your article, who are sort of like dipping into these other cultures, taking little pieces that they like and that they find interesting, but at the end of the day, right, they go home to their their white enclaves. Well, in in Britain there are these people called New Age Gypsies, and they are middle-class young people who adopt a way of life. It's not really a Romany way of life, it's more like the Irish travelers. But they'll rent a horse and car wagon and travel around and cook out in the open and call themselves New Age Gypsies. But when they get tired of it, they can go home to mom and dad, you know. Um, We had a guy in Austin who wanted to be homeless for six months and he lived in a cardboard box and everything. Mm -hmm. And people said, you know, stop it. (laughs) It's just, and then he wrote a book, you know. Mm -hmm. So I don't have much time for people like that. Before when you uh, you were saying something about the hate and love, Mm -hmm. I remember something that relates to politics when here, no? What about politicians? You hate them? Huh? Well, 
in Spanish, we don't say, I hate politicians, no? we say, I don't like politicians. It's totally different. So if we use hate, it's just a confrontation. No? It's, it's not the same as a rejection. But uh, I, I have um, one question. Thank you for the um, What do you think about uh, the, the role of these of the gypsies no? in the future? And people will, will change their perception about gypsies? Or, hmm? I think things will get worse before they get better for mm -hmm. Roma. The, the animosity, and, and we can use hate. Hate is a word I don't like to use casually. This is one thing I tell the students, you can't say I hate getting up at five in the morning. Hate is a very powerful emotion. You should use it properly. But there is real hate directed at Rama. It's gonna take a long time. Part of the problem is that we don't, we're not equipped to speak for ourselves very well because we don't know our own history. We rely on the outside world. We're always going with our hand out, whether it's in public begging or going to governments looking for grants. There's a whole thing we call the gypsy industry, which is just white people making a living writing books and so on about my people. Education is the only way to solve this problem, but we have to be educated and have our own lawyers and so on. But the non-Roma also have to be educated about who we are. They, they, they confuse Romani culture with the culture of poverty, which is a universal culture. I mean, you find it in, in Rio and, and uh, Johannesburg and all around the world where people are poor. Um, it's not ethnically specific. So in Spain, um, the, the Roma there, the Cali, are uh, organizing and, and gaining some clout. But that may be because the language isn't spoken anymore in Spain. Spanish Roma speak Spanish. So there's not that problem of bilingual barrier that you find in, say, Slovakia and so on. Countries where they don't know anything about bilingual education. They think if you don't speak the national language, you know, they put the children in schools for mentally defective not because they're mentally defective, but because they don't speak the national language well. So. I think this will have to be the last question then, We're running out of time. I've been curious as to why, um, with the, the long history that Roma have experienced in terms of racism, discrimination, and murder, I guess, um, how, what do you account for as the slow progression or the lack of progress, I guess, in terms of recognition and respect and uh, of, your, of, of the Romani culture? Because it, it doesn't seem to be as progressive or fast as um, Jews from the you know, 1940s or you know, African Americans in the United States. So, are there major setbacks? Like, what can you speak to some of the major setbacks? Or, and I'm kind of thinking about popular culture in the United States in terms of how Romanis have been portrayed in the media, too. I'm kind of thinking about that and wondering how big of a setback that might have been. All of those things. Um, it, comparison with Jews is good. And The best comparison with Jews would be with Orthodox Jews who have very strict barriers between the Jew their world and the non-Jewish world <coughs> having to do with even physical 
touching, uh, preparation of food, and so on. Romani culture is like that. So the difference is, um, although Jews and Roma shared so much, uh, and still share quite a lot, uh, in 1948, Israel happened. So there is Israel for Jews. We don't have an Israel. So we are a diaspora people. And that alone makes it difficult to organize when we're in so scattered around the world. Um, and different countries have different uh, amounts of input into what they're doing about the Romani minority in a place, say, like Germany or Sweden. The government does a lot. Um, with education and, and so on. In a place like Slovakia or Bulgaria, they do practically nothing at all. Um, and in, in Romania, where, where uh, Roma were slaves for 550 years, those attitudes are still there. Um, in the pogroms in Romania uh, in the mid-90s, where they were going after and killing Roma, and I have a journalist's uh, report where somebody in one of the Romanian villages said you can't call it murder because murder is when you kill human beings. Mm -hmm. And that sort of attitude is still very much there. So uh, it's very frightening. There, there's just a, a increased uh, xenophobia, anti-Semitism is on the rise, Romophobia is on the rise. Um, what do you do? How do you stop it? That's a rotten note to end on, isn't it? <laughs> He's working very hard every day to that. I just wanted to put a plug for his book. If you want to know, uh, you know, there's a lot of good information, things that he talked about in his talk last night, some you know, more information about, I think, what he was answering now. So there are lots of other books that he's written as well, but this is a really good one. It's got recipes in the back as well, and some Romani words and things like that. So let's thank Dr. Hancock. We're so...